when I first heard about it, I just thought, you know, they just explained there's just like three spheres. I said, okay, it doesn't sound like that big of a deal. Then I started seeing more and more pictures of what it's gonna be, and I thought, oh my lord, this is gonna be a, a one-of-a-kind building. It's gonna be a showpiece. We built both of the stadiums up in Seattle. We built the Seattle Library. The Rose Garden, if you go to basketball games, that's one of our jobs. And then we have the Spears, which is nothing like anything we've ever done. Maybe the most excited about working on this is it's all different. The, the welding is different, the pieces are all rolled and twisted. There's nothing straight on it compared to a normal building. And it was just a challenge to try and bring all this together and make it work and look good. You know, I was cautious about the project. It was not in our wheelhouse. Even though we do complex projects, this is a step above. Actually, it might be considered at least five steps above. So we wanted to make sure that we had the right team going in. The initial part of the job when we first got something from the architect and the engineer was a picture of a Catalan period, and then over time it has evolved from the architect and engineer into the details of how they wanted it to look, and we've taken that and come up with the details to make it work. But we take that piece of paper and translate it and grow it into a piece of steel. Even though we're used to working in the public eye and we're used to working in noteworthy projects that are open to view, but they seldom have the, the public proximity that this one does and uh, therefore the workmanship had to be extremely stringently controlled. For the most part, we handle all aspects of fabrication from the time it's raw steel till the time it gets shipped to the job site. For this one, we contracted out with a vendor called Mohawk to handle our parts. They did a phenomenal job in the cutting and CNC breaking of the parts, so they fit really well. And they laser etched all the piece marks on every single part of over 24,000 parts. That saved us a tremendous amount of time. We can get ahead to the point where the main shop is waiting on parts to get their detail. And then Albina Steel rolled all the tubes for us. The tubes were rolled in some cases two and three radiuses within a six foot length. And some of the parts that go into the five-way Catalans were not only rolled to a radius, but they were twisted off access rolling. What would happen is we'd get pallets and pallets of plates in from our vendors, um, foreign plates. And I think it was, I think the number is over 24,000 pieces, make 250 pieces. We had an apprentice here, Roman, who took it upon himself to make sure that everything in the job was tracked. So he knew all the minor member piece marks, he knew what major member they were going to. And he will palletize everything. This pallet here is to build this sub-assembly. And then Ron is the one who set the fabrication sequence and so he fed that info to Roman and that's how they did it. It was the having the parts all correct and dropping in where they're supposed to was what really was the key to putting this thing together. It's just part of the process of what an iron worker does is uh, starts with parts and, and assembles. In the field there's typically some movement in the steel. It's somewhat flexible. You can move it in one direction or another and and basically align them. But with this particular project, there is no movement. You know, you've got 10 different spots on each Catlin that has to precisely meet 10 different spots somewhere else in the sphere. You're dealing with pi at this point instead of normally your 90 degrees. We had to adapt our QC, we had to adapt the way we fit. We took this Leica measuring equipment and built fixtures. We were able to take the CAD programs uh, of the pieces and reverse engineer it to build the fixtures around them virtually. Then with the laser tracker, we were able to cut out parts and assemble them all into this fixture that's laser checked to the exact dimensions that they were designed around. And then welded. So it, it took over 15 fixtures. We bring the pieces, put it as a box, then take him to the another jig for welding. Then let's go to the another uh, jig for grinding. And then once we got them all welded and ground to an AESS profile, we put them into a, one big fixture that made the final cattle. That makes fabrication so much easier. 
when a guy knows, okay, this plate should slip in and fit just like this. Oh, it doesn't? Okay, something's wrong. Or, hey, it does? Great, move on. And then once it was welded, then it was brought out, and the Leica, again, went over it to make sure that it still met the criteria. You know, it's not a perfect world. Our jigs are perfect. Our laser tells us you can't go wrong. Laser tracker can get down into the thousandth of an inch accuracy, and we was trying to get as close as we possibly could because we knew that welding, heat distortion, all that, we knew that that fixture had to be right. Because of the, the stresses on this dome, per se, because you have uh, different stresses on the top part of the dome versus the equator versus uh, underneath where it's setting, all these different changes have equated to all kinds of different kinds of welding for the same pieces. We were instrumental in having a turning fixture for some of the, the minor parts to be able to turn it in position so it was always welded flat to get a better, more profiled weld. Compared to uh, man hand welding, you know, there's a lot of starts and stops. We eliminated the stops and starts. It created a more efficient and a, a better product of having a machine doing the welding. It saved a lot of hours and a lot of time. And then the other issue that it's just come to light was being able to open up this dome that's all interconnected, being able to open it up and put a 40-foot tree down inside of it. And in order to do that, one of the Catlins has to be removable. So there was a lot of re-engineering that went into that. Anytime you're taking a piece out of a building, the rest of it has to be able to hold itself up. They have uh, reinforcements, added extra stiffeners. Some, some get full pins or partial pins. Some of them just get fillet welds. So we really have to pay attention to detail and not take for granted that each one is repetitive. And because of the hidden welds in there, it was brought up. We need to make sure that all the welds inside are looked at and that we have some sort of check off. Well, one of the things that I was uh, instrumental in developing was a booklet that basically tracked every weld and how it was done, who inspected it, and then we, we marry that with the outside test inspection reports. It's a monumental task. There was a lot of AESS required on this because a, a normal job is usually up to within 25 feet. You have to touch it up. This was even tighter. Everything had to be AESS because you could see it and access it from every floor in there. And it took a whole lot more grinding. We ended up having to change out and use soft pads. Typically we use these uh, aluminum oxide red discs. They remove material really quickly, they're really efficient, you know, they last a long time. Problem with that is when you try and grind steel that's going to be painted, every one of those little nicks will actually show through the paint. If you over grind them, you take too much metal out, of course you're going to have to have a welder come back and fill it back in and then you have to grind it again. Our goal is to try to do it one time, one time only. Not only has the grinding had to be different to make it smooth and consistent and really make it look seamless, just our production in itself had to change because, you know, they couldn't leave hammer marks in the plate. In general, these guys really had to adapt to, uh, I'll call it softer <laughs> fabrication techniques. The grinders will go over it, do what they can, what they can see, and then uh, it will come over to us for wheel abrading. We have an eight wheel uh, rotor blaster, and so we wheel the parts as a sub-assembly. Our rotor blaster is, uh, generally gives us an easy SP6 anchor profile for anything we run through it. And then when it was all assembled, it went back out and it was hand blasted with a sand blaster so that you get the right profile throughout the entire piece. Our customer wanted a specific look. They wanted it smooth and consistent, seamless. They want all of this stuff to be showroom finish. We had to bondo parts that it looked better to after it was ground. If you start grinding too much, you start taking away too much metal. I was the only one with any bondo experience going into this. And so I had to train two crews. And uh, I even have a couple guys that we hired in who had bondo experience. They had worked at auto body shops. They got into my bay and they were just, I don't know what to do. When you're doing a car, you have a dent, you have two flat surfaces around the dent. You fill it with Bondo, you make it smooth. This Bondo, we actually have to shape. It's almost like sculpting to make it look like this is one piece. No one could see it and think it was, you know, 50 different pieces put together. 
I believe my employees are real craftsmen, not just on the Spheres job, but on all jobs. It is an art form. You gotta have somebody who cares about what they're doing, that they're just not here to collect a paycheck. We're only doing the primer. They're gonna do a mid coat and a top coat in the field, which helps me out. It takes a lot of pressure off in that sense. It goes on in one coat with this paint. It's really easy to achieve because it's a, it's a really friendly paint to work with. Keep in mind that this paint job was a 30-year paint job. There's 11,000 species of plants going in this, 500 of which are endangered. I have been told that they won't even put plants in it for the first year until they acclimate it. Any of the VOCs have dissipated and that they've climatized the entire unit. We've shipped a lot of wide pieces before, but the thing with this is this is the weirdest job we've probably ever shipped because every single load we're doing, with the exception of six or seven, I believe, are odd shaped. We're gonna ship 250 pieces, or right around there. The size of these loads are required by the state of Washington to be super loads. Anything over 18 feet becomes a super load, which uh, entails taking you know two lanes of the highway all the way from Portland to Seattle. And of course, they're very critical as far as every town and county that they have to go through. Uh, each county has to make sure that they have uh, no highway repairs being done, no bridges being painted, anything that would happen during the uh, hours that they give us the ship. Now these uh, super loads, they can, they can leave uh, Oregon around midnight or can just be entering Washington at midnight. So we have that critical time of sitting on the uh, 205 bridge. Then we have to go straight up with our, with our pilot cars and state police and get us to the job site the way they want us to go. They'll route us in especially whichever way happens to not have any construction going on in the middle of the night or anything. And then we have to be off the street by legally 6 o'clock, but we shoot to have the trucks parked and the drivers out of the trucks at 5.30 a.m. every morning. The, the configuration of the pieces makes everything just that much more difficult than a straight stand-up high-rise building, which just has straight beams that stack up real nice and neat. It is a lot more difficult and a lot more special. Time has to go into it. They have to be real safe. That's my job to make sure that happens. We were very pleased to be chosen to build this iconic building. This uh, Spheres project has been in magazines all over the world already. It gives me personally pride to work on it, and I know it does as a company. When people stop by, one of the things the architect and engineer had in their RFQ that was out is how do we keep people from stopping in the road to look at this building. And I think it's going to be an award-winning project. and. Any one of our vendors, uh, anyone that's been associated with this, can really stand proud that they've had a piece of this. This is a, a, an art project, and to have your hand on an art project, I think is very exciting. I think this is gonna be one of those projects, much like the Seattle Library. How'd you do that? With a lot of patience. You know, my friends are, are tired of being in the car with me driving around Portland, and I'm like, hey, I built that. Hey, I built that. And they're like, yeah, Levi, we know. You tell us every time you pass it. I'm like, oh, and I'm not gonna stop. <laughs> you know, when you say, can you do anything? There's such a wide variety of new development coming up nowadays and the requirements of the customers and the different designs. And so it's a real mystery of what may come up next. And that curiosity and, and, and want to challenge that. It makes it fun and enjoyable in, in this trade, it, it does. It's like one of those things, like like you win a lottery. Yes, look, I had done it. When, when you take a job that has no dimensions on it and you have to do everything through the laser tracker, it was a little apprehensive about, hey, how, how are we gonna do this? It's, it's turned out great, the tolerances are coming out. I know the architect and engineer are happy with what they're seeing. I know that we give our clients more than they ask for. I, I know that because they tell me that. And when they award this, uh, they let us know that we were preferred contractor. They also let us know they had very high expectations of what we would provide them and they tell us uh, and very clearly they know on certain terms that we, even though they had high expectations, we've blown them away. You get almost emotional about it. 